Welcome everyone to a Speakeasy Ideas video seminar. I'm Dr. Tom Krenowitter, president of Speakeasy Ideas. And uh, recently, you probably heard, the Supreme Court handed down some opinions in the Masterpiece Cake case. And I wanted to offer some commentary. It, it seems very few people are thinking clearly, thinking well about the core subjects that are embedded in that case. Instead, they get, they get distracted in all kinds of secondary ways. So this conversation here, I'm, I'm not looking to rehash um, constitutional law cases, Supreme, past Supreme Court cases, and the precedents they set, and all kinds of tests they came up regarding free exercise, and the, the Establishment Clause, and Free Speech Clause, you know, there's the Lemon Test, the Sherbert Test. I know it almost sounds like, it's like someone's making some kind of dessert for us uh, when you get into those court cases. If you're interested in that, right, you can go take a course in constitutional law, and you can see what the Supreme Court has had to say about the free exercise clause and the uh, uh, free speech clause of the First Amendment. Or for that matter, you can get a, a, a con law casebook, you know, uh, something like this. Uh, this, is, this is my favorite. It was edited by uh, one of my professors, one of my mentors in graduate school, uh, Professor Ralph Rossum. And, and what, it, what, what a casebook does is it has assembled for you uh, all the leading cases in each area of, of constitutional jurisprudence. That's not what this is all about. Um, this is also not any kind of attempt to defend, apologize, make excuses for racist or racism, nothing like that. In fact, I'm gonna come back to those subjects um, a little later in our, our conversation and frame this larger issue of, of property rights and public accommodation laws in light of American history regarding slavery and racism and Jim Crow and, and the civil rights movement. So I'll, I'm going to come back to uh, those subjects. For now, let's focus on the core conflict, the core, the core problem that led to the controversy in the, in, in the case of Jack Phillips, he's the owner of, of Masterpiece Cake Shop um, here in the Denver area down in Lakewood. And there are other similar cases too, of which you, you might have heard. One was in, involves a, a photography studio, there's another involving a pizzeria. And, <clears throat> And commentators usually are really quick to jump to things like the religious beliefs of, of certain uh, people involved in these cases versus uh, the sexual preferences of other people, right? And so you have, you have conservative Christians versus a homosexual couple and the whole question of same-sex marriage gets thrown in there. And I'm here to suggest all of that all of that, th those are distractions. That's not the core. In each one of these cases, what it really boils down to is government passes some kind of public accommodation laws. Right? And those laws say, if you're a business owner, you shall do this and this and this and this. They're commandments. You, you will do this or you will be punished. And there is a business owner. Or as I'm going to point out here in a little bit, a property owner, because after all, every private business is just a form of private property, right? And so we're talking about some business owner, some property owner, who says no, right? The government says you shall do these things and some property owner, some business owner says, no, I don't want to. I don't want to do that. In each one of these cases, it's someone declining to do something. It's not that they're actively doing something. They're refraining from action. They're declining to act to do something. And that's when these lawsuits arise. 
The conflict, in other words, at its core, exists because some private property owners, some business owners, don't want to do everything that public accommodation laws command them to do. And then instantly, right, in every one of these cases, instantly, you know, in the case of Jack Phillips, they go off and all kind of, well, what's, what's Jack Phillips, you know, religious views, he doesn't want to bake the cake because he holds certain views about the Bible or, or, or Christianity, and, 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 and that offends, right, uh, the sensibility of, of the same-sex couple over here who wants the cake baked for their, for their wedding and then they, and then all kinds of, of iterations of that, right? So, so then, so then Jack Phillips says, well, right, this is about my religious freedom, my religious liberty. And then later it comes along, no, 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 this is really about, this is about my free speech because, uh, because when I make a cake that is, that is, that is an expression of art, it's an artistic expression, which is a form of speech. And so making me make a cake that I don't want to is, is basically making me say something, is making me exercise speech that I don't want to exercise. And that's where all the conversations are. All the conversations on both sides, right? Liberals are, 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 are talking about uh, friends that they have who are same-sex couples and, and how offended they are, how wrong it is for them to be discriminated against. I want to come back and... and talk about that word briefly later, um, because some business owner didn't want to do something that they wanted done, and, and then conservatives rally behind Jack Phillips and say, well, this is all about his religious freedom, free speech. And, and if you actually read through all, of, all five of the opinions handed down in the Supreme Court, you'll, see, you'll find all this, all of it's in there. There's an argument for religious freedom, there's an argument for free speech, uh, there's an argument that it's okay for government to come and command business owners uh, so long as, uh, uh, as it's commanding business owners to do things for certain, uh, what the court used to call insular and discrete minority groups. In other words, pick out groups of citizens, put them into groups and say, businesses must make certain kinds of accommodations for members of this group. And, and, and again, what I'm suggesting here is all of that, all of that is a distraction. And if we remember what private property actually means and the purpose of law regarding private property, that these problems go away. Here, here's the thing. The conclusion, to really think clearly, that part of, part of what I'm doing here, um, I, I mentioned a few minutes ago, my purpose here is not to recite constitutional law. I get it. I understand it. I've, I've studied constitutional law. I've taught constitutional law. I've written about constitutional law. So I get it. But it's not to just repeat what I consider to be kind of uh, flimsy arguments and doctrines that have been handed down by the Supreme Court. That, that's not my purpose here. My purpose is rather to engage in an exercise of thinking like a constitutionalist, how to think clearly like a constitutionalist, how to think about related subjects such as property, private property, property rights, and the purpose of government, the meaning of law, fundamental concepts like that. If we think clearly about these things, I'm proposing these conflicts that we saw in the Masterpiece Cake case go away. Now, when we mention public accommodation laws, of course, the big one, the important one, is the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Uh, some of you may recall a presidential candidate, Barry Goldwater, actually opposed the 1964 Civil Rights Act, uh, not because he was a racist. Barry Goldwater was the farthest thing from a racist. Barry Goldwater spent a career defending equal protection of the laws for all citizens. Uh, but Goldwater's problem with the 1964 Civil Rights Act, he, he thought it was unconstitutional. He made the argument that the Constitution doesn't actually grant Congress the power to make laws that, that command business owners, that command property owners, what to do with their own property. 
Um, and, and, the, and Title II of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, Title II, is the part of that act that pertains to businesses, in particular what that act calls public accommodations. And it actually lists them. You can uh, go ahead and Google Title II of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. It's not, it's not terribly long. And you'll see in the law the kinds of businesses it consider to be public accommodations. So, uh, you know, things like hospitals are in there, but also restaurants, hotels, theaters. All of these are said to be public accommodations. And then uh, states followed suit, and many states have passed similar kinds of public accommodations laws. Currently, 45, I believe, there are 45 states that have state public accommodation laws, which basically say the same thing, that it is, it's illegal, it criminalizes a business owner um, discriminating against someone, in other words, refusing service based on uh, race or gender, and then, you know, some states add other criteria in there, uh, uh, you know, sexual preferences or, or um, I'm trying to think of uh, gender identification, things like that. Uh, but 45 out of the 50 states have state-based. And that was, the, that was the rub here in Colorado. The Masterpiece Cake uh, case involved a Colorado, a state public accommodation law. And, and we start to see problems when you, when you dig in, right? These laws assume or define every business to be a public accommodation. And there are several problems with that. Um, first of all, a business, if it truly is private property, then it accommodates or is open to whomever the owner says it's open to, whoever the owner invites. And of course, anyone invited is perfectly free to decline the invitation. Doesn't mean anybody has to go in. But if it's truly private property, then it's not a public accommodation until and unless the owner declares it to be a public accommodation. What has happened with these public accommodation laws is government has come along and said, oh, you have a restaurant? We're defining your business, your property, to be a public accommodation, and here's what that means. Here's who you have to engage in trades with, business trades. <clears throat> Some of you are, might be thinking right now, well, what, what, what is Cranowitter saying? Is he suggesting that a property owner, a business owner, may invite just whomever he or she wants? Yes, that's what I'm actually suggesting. And here, just to help us think clearly, set aside the notion of business. We're going to address that, that concept in a moment. But set it aside just for a moment and think about your home. Your home is your property. That's private property. And who is accommodated in your house? Who is welcome to come into your house? And the answer is those people and only those people you invite into your home. Why? Why is that? Why, why isn't someone you have not invited? Why aren't they accommodated in your home? And the answer be, is because your home is your property. You... Uh, I'm going to use a word that has now a very negative connotation, but it's actually a perfectly harmless word in its traditional meaning. You discriminate between who you want to invite into your house and who you don't want to invite. And why are the people, when you don't invite people, why don't you invite them? Who knows? There could be a thousand different reasons why you don't invite certain people. It doesn't really matter why. The bottom line is it's your property. Your home is your property. And so you have the natural freedom to choose, to discriminate who you invite and who you don't. And that's all the word discriminate means. To discriminate simply means to choose, to make a choice. There's another problem with this notion of public accommodation laws by saying that businesses are somehow this really special category of private property. 
And however we think about other forms of property, like your house, your car, your computer, your clothes, right? Those are all things that you own and you're free to do with them what you want, trade with whom you want to trade them. But when it comes to your business, hold on, that's a really special kind of private property. And we're gonna have government come along, whether at the federal level or the state level, we're going to have government come along and command what you do with that form of private property. I'm suggesting that this notion of a business is in no way easy to identify. Now, you can certainly look up the word business in a dictionary. Go ahead, I encourage you, Google it. You can find it while you're watching this video. But think through the concept of a business. What exactly, when do human interactions become business interactions? Suppose, just for the sake of argument, just for a, uh, this is an exercise in thinking clearly. If we had two people, maybe they live by each other, they can see each other, right? And <clears throat> we want to know, they interact, and we want to know precisely when their interaction becomes a business interaction. And suppose one person over here uh, grows some tomatoes and gives a tomato to her neighbor. Is that a business transaction? Well, not necessarily, right? Uh, suppose the neighbor asks for a tomato. Neighbor over here says, hey, I see you grew some tomatoes. You have a big basket. I really love tomatoes. Would you give me one? And, and this neighbor gives one. Uh, how about if this neighbor over here says, hey, I'd like one of your tomatoes, and this person says, you know, I'll give you one in exchange for some of your time. I'm kind of lonely, and I would like some company. Come sit and talk with me, and I'll give you a tomato. Now, they've just engaged in a kind of trade. Is that a business exchange? Uh, suppose this one over here says, hey, I'd like to have one of your tomatoes, and this person says, okay, I see you grew some potatoes. I'll trade you one, one tomato for one of your potatoes. Is, is that a business transaction? Suppose this person says, hey, I'd like to have one of your tomatoes, and this neighbor over here says, well, I'll give you some tomatoes in exchange for you to come and talk to me, sit with me, because I wanna pick your brain about the law, and I know you've studied the law. Is that a business exchange? Hopefully you start to see the problem that drawing a clear line and trying to, to define you know, and say all human interactions on one side of the line are not businesses, but all human interactions on the other side are businesses is highly arbitrary. It's much better rather than, here's what I'm suggesting, rather than carving out certain forms of property and labeling them businesses and saying, well, if it's a business property, then government has to license it and, and, and they have to pay special business taxes and then they're going to be subject to public accommodation laws and all kinds of other laws and regulations. What if instead we set aside that notion of business and focused on property? And we thought through the purpose of government. What is the purpose of government? Why? It's to protect the person and property of citizens. Now all of a sudden, these public accommodation laws start to look very different. Yeah, think about it. What if the purpose of government was to protect the person and the property of each and every citizen? And that's it. What if that's all government was supposed to do? Make sure that each and every citizen is secure in his or her own person, right? So you, others are not allowed to come and steal from you or, or assault you or murder you, right? You're, you're secure in your person and you're secure in your property. Other people can't come and damage what is yours. They can't come and steal what is yours, burn down what is yours. That was the view of the founders. That's the main purpose of government, to protect each citizen in his or her property. Now, with that view, that's the purpose of government. Look at this conflict. This conflict is arising between public accommodation laws and business owners, property owners, because in this case right here, government is not 
protecting the person and the property of citizens. It's coming in and violating the property of citizens. It's coming in and commanding to citizens, you shall do these things with your property. That's not protecting it. That's violating property rights. So what's the suggestion? Look, um, I understand the reality where we are in the United States right now, culturally, politically, legally. I get that getting rid of public accommodation laws is probably never going to happen. That's not my purpose here. My purpose here is not to, to uh, figure out a strategy to repeal public accommodation laws. My purpose is to help you understand and think clearly. Understand that so long as we have public accommodation laws, so long as we have government coming and commanding property owners saying, you shall do these things. You shall interact with these uh, groups of people. You shall engage in these trades, whether you want to or not. And it doesn't matter what reason you have, you will do this. As long as we have those laws, we're gonna have these conflicts because there are going to be property owners, right, who are free human beings, and there are gonna be moments when they make choices they don't want to do what the government is commanding them to do. And sometimes they will choose to not do what government is commanding them for really low base purposes. And sometimes they're gonna make that choice for higher purposes, for nobler purposes. My point is, rather than getting into exam psychoanalyses of their reasoning, why didn't you bake that cake? The problem is precluded. The problem never happens. If we look at a business owner like Jack Phillips and say, you know what? The building is his. The oven is his. The flour is his. The sugar, the eggs, every whatever he uses to make his cakes. That's his property. He's free to offer to trade that property with no one if he wants to. He can sit on all that inventory and let it go to waste if he wants to because it's his. Or he can bake some cakes with those ingredients and he can offer to trade them to a few of his friends or relatives or other people that he tends to like. Or if he chooses, he can bake some cakes, you know, put a, put a little sign for sale, $10, $20, or whatever he wants to charge. That too is his decision. And say, anyone is welcome to come and buy these cakes. And then of course, the rest of the world, or, or at least whomever is invited to come and buy his cakes, they're perfectly free to accept his invitation, decline his offer, make some kind of counter argument or counter offer, right? Come along and say, I won't pay $25 for that cake that you offered me. I, I might pay 15 bucks, right? And then, and then whatever the result is, it has to be mutually voluntary. They, might, they have to both agree to it. That would actually be respecting, protecting property rights. Now, many of you right now are thinking, well, hold on, hold on. Uh, if we didn't have public accommodation laws, that means going back to the era of Jim Crow and, and race-based violence and, and the Ku Klux Klan and all these horrible kind of things that nobody wants. I don't want. Nobody else wants them. And I don't think that's the case. So uh, some of you watching this, you might know this about me. Many, many of you probably don't know about me. So uh, my academic background, my PhD is in political science, uh, part of the social sciences. And the area that I focused on was the, the American historical experience in racism, slavery, uh, the Civil War, the subsequent rise of the Jim Crow era, uh, the Civil Rights Movement, all the challenges there. In fact, um, one of my early books, uh, Vindicating Lincoln, was, it was uh, uh, featured by the History Book Club, and it was endorsed highly by the chairman of the Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission. I mention these things merely, merely to say, I do know something, I don't claim to know everything, but I do know something about the history of race 
in the United States and the challenges. And it's a curious thing. In the case of slavery, which was abolished by, through, through the course of the Civil War and eventually the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, in the case of slavery, slavery was an abject failure on the part of government to fulfill its purpose, to do what the one thing it's supposed to do. Remember, what, what's the legitimate purpose of government? To protect the person and the property of each and every citizen. And yet, what slavery meant was government. The law actually authorized some human beings to claim ownership in other human beings. The very opposite of what government is supposed to do. And as Lincoln pointed out, slavery could not have lasted one day, one hour, one minute anywhere if it was not enforced by law. If you didn't have laws enforcing it, slavery couldn't have continued in, in the United States. That was Lincoln's argument. Afterwards, think about the, 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 the horrific rise of Jim Crow, which corresponds very much with the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. And this kind of, let's, let's be real clear what the Ku Klux Klan was. The Ku Klux Klan was the greatest terrorist organization, the most violent terrorist organization in, in American history. Uh, people were terrified of the Ku Klux Klan because they did terrifying, horrific things, including burning down people's houses and, and rape and assault and murder. That's what the Klan did. That's why people were scared of them. And I'm going to say something controversial here. I know it's controversial. And some of you might agree, some of you might disagree. I, I encourage you to, to think it through. Uh, life for ordinary black men and women and children in the United States during the period of Jim Crow, especially in the, you know, the period after the Civil War, the early 1900s, the 19-teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, it, life was brutal. And I don't know how, to, how else to characterize it. It was a, in many instances, li life was a kind of living nightmare, a living hell for black men and women and children in the United States. And why? 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 What made it so bad? Well, let's be really clear. There were, there were segregation policies in many states. And even where you didn't have official segregation policies, you had segregation practices. You had businesses and other organizations that just said, you know, black's not allowed, black's not welcome, whites only, that sort of thing. And we today look at that, right? We, we find that terrible. It's, it, it's offensive. It is offensive. It's, it's far beyond rude. And yet, what made life a living nightmare for many black men and women and children in the United States during that period was not that some restaurant owner, some cafe owner, wouldn't let a black man sit at the lunch counter. That was offensive. That was, that was incredibly rude. But that is not what made their life hell. Right? In fact, if you surveyed opinions at that time, Right? You would likely find a, a whole range of opinions, right? If, if there was a restaurant in town, if there was a lunch counter that, that wouldn't serve blacks, you asked black people there in that town, what do you think of that? Uh, some were probably greatly offended. How dare they not let me sit at that lunch counter? Others probably said, screw them. I don't want to go sit at their lunch counter, right? And probably a whole other range of opinions. What made life so difficult for black men, women, and children during the Jim Crow era was when white supremacists showed up in the middle of the night with torches and, you know, the 
the husband, the father of the family runs outside and there's not much he can do. And he sees his house get burned down. He sees his wife and his children murdered right in front of him before he gets his head cut off with a shovel. And in the course of that brutal, unjust violence, remember the proper purpose of government is to protect the person and property of citizens. And again, this was an abject failure. Government wasn't protecting the person or the property of black men and women and children during Jim Crow. In, in fact, just the opposite. Not only was, it wasn't just that government was, was neutral, was doing nothing. That would have been bad enough. That would be bad, right? If government just said, oh, we're just not getting involved when, when someone with black skin is, is assaulted or raped or murdered, we're just not going to get involved. No, it was even worse than that. It was even worse. That black man watching his house being burned down and his family being slaughtered couldn't reach for the help of government. You know why? Because in many instances, the local sheriff was one of the white supremacists under the hood. The local judge was one of the Klansmen. The local district attorney was there. It was, it was members of government actively engaged in the unjust, violent terrorism. That's what made life so hellish. Now think about that. If the problem, the, 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 the core problem for American black men, women, children during Jim Crow, if the big problem was that government was either, either indirectly or directly involved in arson and assault and theft and rape and murder, what's the solution, right? If that's the problem, government is directly or indirectly involved, it's, it's, it's authorizing, it's sponsoring, it's protecting horrific injustice. If that's the problem, then the solution is for government to stop directly or indirectly authorizing arson and theft and assault and rape and murder. That's the solution. Start protecting the person and property of each and every citizen, regardless of what they look like. That's the whole concept of the equal protection of the laws. Not, not carving or dividing citizens into groups and say, oh, oh, if you own what we call a business, then this law applies to you. And you have to do certain things. You don't have to do those things if you don't own what we call it. That's not equal protection of the law. Equal protection of the law, say, look, whatever is yours right now, whatever you produce, whatever you earn, whatever you trade for, that's yours, rightfully yours, the law is going to protect you in that. Make sure that people cannot steal it or don't steal it, or they get punished if they try, if they do that. That's the purpose of government. Had that happened during Jim Crow, had, had we simply done this, if we'd gone from white supremacists in government violating the individual rights of black men and women and children, and we had gone, the United States had transitioned to a situation where people in government were offering equal protection of the laws for the person and property of every American, regardless of what they look like, regardless of what their religion is, or, or what kind of sexual preference they have, or what their you know, favorite flavor of ice cream is. The point is equal protection of the laws for all citizens so that they are secure in their person and property. Life would have looked really different. You might still have had some lunch counter owner who said, I don't want this group or that group is not welcome. And you know what they would do? <laughs> People in those groups 
would offer their own lunch counters. They, they would cook meals out of their homes and, and sell it to other people and then start their own restaurants. Remember, capital, what we call capital, which is needed to usually to start up a business. You need some kind of capital. Capital is just a, a form of wealth. Capital is wealth. And wealth is created. Wealth doesn't just exist out there. Let me, let me put this in terms very particular to this subject. In the 1930s and 1940s and 1950s, wealth did not exist only in the banks owned by white supremacists. Banks owned by white supremacists did have some wealth, they had some money, they had some currency, they had some capital. Yes, they did, but that wasn't all the wealth in the world because wealth is created, which means others who are not in any way connected with the white supremacist bank owner, owner others are free to create wealth. And how do they create wealth? They do something valuable to others, something that other people find valuable, something that other people want, other people need, other people appreciate, something for which other people will trade. Could black men and women have created wealth in the 1930s and 1940s and 50s? Could they have done something that was valuable to other people, that other people would trade for if they had been secure in their person and property? Yeah, they could have, of course, of course. That's what free people do. Free people don't all necessarily like each other. Free people don't necessarily hang out with each other and interact with each other. Free people look to improve their own lives and they do it by being productive, by, by becoming more valuable to people around them that they do interact with. But that wasn't the response in the United States to the problem of Jim Crow. Rather than saying, well, this government that is authorizing murder and rape and arson and all these horrible things, or we're going to make sure government doesn't do that anymore and stop. Instead, as a nation, we went all the way and said, in fact, we're going to now, we're going to abandon this idea that government should protect property and we're going to have government get involved commanding what property owners do. And so now we're at a place in American history where we have federal laws and state laws where government comes in and commands business owners to do th things that in some cases they don't want to. Jack Phillips, right, for his own reasons, he didn't want to bake that cake for that particular wedding. Is, it, is that the best thing in the world? No. Is it the worst thing in the world? No. Is it the sort of thing that a free human being does choose with whom to interact and what to do with his own property? Yeah. That's the kind of thing free people do all the time. That's the way that they should do. So my point is simply this. Understand that as long as we have these public accommodation laws, we're going to see conflicts with property owners, business owners who don't want to do certain things that government is commanding them to do. And the rub there is not, is not, you know, which, which constitutional test about free speech or free exercise clause do we need to, to you know, uh, utilize in this particular case. Now, that's not the core. The core is if government did its one legitimate job, protect the person and property of citizens, these conflicts wouldn't arise. These, these wouldn't exist. And then every cake baker would be free to offer his cakes to anybody he wants. And anyone who was offered a cake would be free to decline or accept the offer, which is the way free people think about these things. Thank you.